colleges all over the country. I'm very grateful for the opportunity afforded me by the academic community. It is the last, as far as I'm concerned, it is the last prestige of free speech left in our country. Sorry to say it's usually accorded to me by liberals. Conservatives are usually too chicken to let me speak. And I want to again say how grateful I am, regardless of the politics of the uh, Open Mind Club, I'm most grateful to them for the fight they have put up to see that there is not only free speech for communists, but also free speech for anti-communists. I would like to also say that I am not here to abuse that privilege. I am not going to insult anybody or use any racial epithets and that sort of thing. When I operate in the streets, I am not ashamed to say that I agitate. My opponents, they certainly agitate. They use every me possible method of agitation. And in the street, that's often the only way that you can gain public attention. And I do it all the time and go to jail for it. I am not here to agitate. You see no uniforms. There is no party buttons. There will be no attempt in any way to agitate. I am here to present to the best of my ability facts and ideas, which changed me from an ordinary student at Brown University, as many of you are, to the point where I am now proud to stand before you as a National Socialist. And I'm going to try to give you some insight tonight into the facts which came to my attention, which I believe you've been denied, which caused me to make that change. All I can do, ladies and gentlemen, is to pre present to you a few, a very few samples of what I consider to be shocking facts and ask you to do what I had to do after I found out these things and go check them out for yourselves. Now, I understand, unlike any other speech that I've made any, around the country, and I make them every day, all over America and around Canada. I have a paragraph here from this morning's paper. It says, an ad hoc committee formed to educate the student body and public at large about Rockwell's group has been working all week to nullify in advance 
the effect of anything Rockwell has to say. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, there is a concept known as prejudging things. When you judge something in advance before you've heard or seen it, and it's called prejudice. And anybody who has walked into this hall, anybody who has walked into this hall and prejudged my speech on the basis of this week's work of my opponents who haven't got the guts to face me, they will never debate me. I have asked and asked and asked if they will, in a formal manner, stand up and debate me. And I hereby again say, if in an orderly manner at any time, I will be reinvited here, I will debate the head of the ADL, I will debate the B'nai B'rith, the Hillel Foundation, or anybody else who wants to stand up and challenge the facts that I'll present, but they'll never do it. They talk behind my back and what a rat I am and show you movies and so forth, propaganda. They will not debate the facts. This is an unusual circumstance. It's always done at most colleges. I've never seen anybody spend a whole week trying to ruin what I can do in 50 minutes. And I think I'm going to cream them anyway. Now, let me start off my regular presentation by saying this to you, ladies and gentlemen. To the best of my knowledge, you've had at least three communists speak here at Brown University and at Pembroke. In fact, one of them, I think Mr. Jackson, had tea with the girls here at Pembroke. I wonder... <laughs> he did. I think it was two years ago. He not only spoke, but they had a tea for it. I wonder how many of the Jews who have been raising the devil about me speaking here raised any fuss at all about this communist not only speaking but having tea with our Pembroke girls. I have never heard of any Jew fussing about any communist coming to speak. The only time they fuss is when an anti-communist comes to speak. Now, I'll present that for your own judgment. You look back and see if you remember any fuss, any uh, $700 worth of policemen necessary to protect any communist speaker. I haven't heard of it. Now, the reason for it, ladies and gentlemen, is because the Jews do not want certain facts to come to your attention. I maintain you are not only the victims of what they call managed news, you're the victims of suppressed news, news that you're not allowed to hear. I didn't hear it. When I was sitting out there where you are, in fact, the last time I was at uh, alumni, although come to think, but I wasn't sitting, I was hanging on to a girl about half stewed at a dance. <laughs> But in the times when I used to be sitting out there as a member of the Brown audience and they told me about Adolf Hitler and that he was out to conquer my country, I didn't just think about it or talk about it. I did something about it. I enlisted as a sailor in the United States Navy to go fight him because I believed all that I had been told. And I just found out, ladies and gentlemen, that I was told a lot of lies. And I'm going to present some of them here to you tonight. Now, what I maintain, ladies and gentlemen, the whole thrust of my speech tonight will be that you cannot have an educated opinion you cannot manage the affairs of a so-called democracy unless you are given all the facts. If you are denied some of the facts, or if the facts are twisted or misrepresented, then you cannot possibly guide the ship of state. Any more than a navigator could guide a ship if you deprived him of the information of his latitude and longitude, the speed of the ship, and so forth. You have got to let people know the facts of the matter before they can judge correctly. And I maintain that most people who are liberals and I have found that they are sincere, dedicated and sincere people, are liberals, and most of them in the academic community are liberals. The reason is because the facts that they are given leave them no choice. Now, the reason for it, ladies and gentlemen, I maintain, as I've said, is that you are deprived of facts. Your minds work in many ways like a computer. You are not exactly like a computer, but your minds work like a computer in this respect. If you feed into a computer false information, you know you are not going to get good information, good solutions out. If you feed lies into a computer, you're going to get lies and false information out. If you neglect to put information into a computer, you can't get valid answers. Your minds work the same way. If they have some way of keeping from you knowledge which you must know, you cannot make valid decisions. Now, I have said I cannot present all the facts that change me to the point where I'm leading a Nazi movement around the world, I can present a few of the most shocking. And it is my hope, and it's been my experience throughout the country as I've spoken, in spite of all the prejudging, in spite of all the education, as they call it, before I speak, when I show you some of these facts, I think you will have the same experience that other students have had at other colleges. Some of you will have the guts and the integrity to go at least and check and find out whether these things exist whether they're what I say they are, and if they are, you will begin to change your judgments. Now, before I present my first document, let me say this. 
I invariably run into the business. They say, oh, well, Rockwell's just waving a piece of paper up there. How do we know what it says on it? Or he's taking it out of context. Well, first, let me say this to you. Every document that I'm going to present to you, you can get from me for nothing, free. All the address you need is George Lincoln Rockwell, Arlington, Virginia. And I will send you the full document, not the part that I'm going to read, because I can't read all the documents, all of the whole of them. I will read portions of them, and you can send for and get the entire document. Before I made this speech, I was required to submit the documents to the committee. They've seen them all. And I assure you that on the level, I'll go further. If anybody, Jewish war veteran, or anybody else here can prove that I am lying about any of these documents, that they don't exist, they're phony documents, I will go to work for Harry Golden and Martin Luther King for nothing in the NAACP. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, the first document I want to show you is by a man of unimpeachable credentials, a man that I'm sure you cannot say is a bigot or a hate monger or there's anything wrong with him, a man that you cannot find fault with. And I think what, you, what he says you will find extremely shocking. This document right here is reduced. It's a full-page newspaper article. The author of it is Winston Churchill. His picture is on it. I wonder if there's the people booing and hissing for Winston Churchill. I, that's a new one on me. Winston Churchill is the author of this article. I will give you the date. I got it out of the Library of Congress. February 8, 1920, Illustrated London Sunday Herald. The Library of Congress made the copy from which I reproduced this copy here. It's called Zionism versus Bolshevism, a struggle for the soul of the Jewish people. And Winston Churchill in this article says the Jews are being torn. Half of them want to be Zionists and half of them want to be communists. And he suggests they should all be Zionists. But he does say something that I want you to listen to. He discusses the Russian Revolution. Now let me, let me read you a paragraph in which Winston Churchill is discussing, first he discusses the Zionists, now he's going to take up the communists and the Jews, and here's what he says, international Jews, in violent opposition to all the sphere of Jewish effort, rise the schemes of the international Jews. The adherents of this sinister confederacy are mostly men reared up among the unhappy populations of countries where they, the Jews are persecuted on account of their race. Most, if not all of them, have forsaken the faith of their forefathers and divorced from their minds all spiritual hopes of the next world. This movement, talk about communism, this movement among the Jews is not new. From the days of Spartacus Weishaupt to those of Karl Marx, and needless to parenthetically, Karl Marx, of course, was Jewish, to those of Karl Marx and down to Trotsky, and um, I think very few of you know that Trotsky's real name was Bronstein, Leon Bronstein, not Trotsky. To Trotsky in Russia, Bella Kuhn in Hungary, Rosa Luxemburg in Germany, and Emma Goldman in the United States, this worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization and for the reconstitution of society on the basis of arrested development, of envious malevolence, and impossible equality has been steadily growing. It played, as a modern writer, Mrs. Webster, has so ably shown a definitively recognizable part in the tragedy of the French Revolution. It has been the mainspring of every subversive movement in the 19th century. Now listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. This is Winston Churchill telling you about the Russian Revolution. And now, at last, this band of extraordinary personalities from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America have gripped the Russian people by the hair of their heads and have become practically the undisputed masters of this enormous empire. Now, you Jewish war veterans, you just proved that Churchill didn't say that or you just proved that I misread it, or you just disproved that the Russian Revolution wasn't uh, Russian, or rather than it wasn't Jewish, that it was Russian, and I'll quit. What I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, is that you have not been told in your history classes that the Russian Revolution wasn't Russian. It was the capture of Russia by the Jews. That's the truth. Now, you can call me any name you want. If Winston Churchill said this, and if it's true, then you must ask yourself, how come you haven't been told this? Why are you not allowed to know this? this now, yelling and hollering, this, I go through this all the time. Nobody's going to shut me up by yelling or it would have been done long ago. I'm just telling you that this is just one of the facts that I began to look into. Then I began to discover there were more. You have the bag there. I want to show you some documents I got from the United States Archives, from the United States of America Archives in Washington, D.C., 
seal with the seal of the United States. They're sealed with ribbons here. Here's one of them. These are reports. Now, again, if there's anything fake about these documents, you just stop me. Put me out of business. This is a public statement. If this is phony, you just prove it, and I'll fold up and quit and go to work. In fact, I'll work for the Jewish war veterans. I'll put on a star of David if this is phony. Here we have, here we have a report. Remember, I will send you a printed copy of this, if you wish, so you can check to see whether this is on the level. It's gotten from the United States government. It would be forgery to fake it. And here is a report from the intelligence section of the United States Army to the United States Army and the President of the United States during the Russian Revolution about the nature of the Russian government. He says, a table made up in April 1918. The correspondent of the London Times shows that at that time there were 384 commissars in the top government of Russia including two Negroes, 13 Russians, 15 Chinamen, 22 Armenians, and more than 300 Jews. This is the government of Russia. Now, here comes another report in the same dossier here. He says, it is probably unwise to say this loudly in the United States, but the Bolshevik movement is and has been made up since its beginning and guided and controlled by Russian Jews of the greasiest type. That's the fact, ladies and gentlemen. Now, these, these documents, when I first saw these things myself, I couldn't believe them. I thought, well, how could I, how could I possibly not have heard this from all my history professors, from Professor Ducasse in the philosophy department where I was a major? How come I didn't know about this when I first found them? Somebody is pulling my leg. So I started studying the Jewish documents. I went to the San Diego Library and got the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia. You must have it over here in the library. Go get it and look up the Russian Revolution, and you will find these Jews boasting how they put on the Russian Revolution. But who will ever read it? They don't just sign that in the history course. This is for their boys to read so they can tell each other how good they're doing. You're not supposed to know about it. And I maintain that unless you do know it, unless you do know where communism is coming from and you're willing to talk about it, you will never be able to deal with it, whether you like it or not. I mean, whether you like communism or you don't like it, you ought at least to know that the Jewish people are behind it. And once you understand that, then you can deal realistically with it, whether you like it or not, one way or the other. Until you do know it and until you can talk about it, you are deprived of information. Now, let me point something out, ladies and gentlemen. In Russia, you have freedom of speech. You can criticize anybody you want except the communists. In China, you have freedom of speech. You can criticize anybody you want except the communists. In Cuba, you can criticize anybody you want except Castro. In the United States of America, you can criticize Irishmen, Italians, Frenchmen, people from Brown, Pembrokers, but you can't, you can't criticize Jews. And if you think you can, try it tomorrow. Just go out and say, you know, I think Rockwell is right. I think these Jews are pulling something rotten on us. Try it. You'll be called an anti-Semite. You'll be subjected to terrorism. What the kids that have invited? Well, let me, you don't believe it, eh? I have spoken all over the country now for years, no difficulties at all. This is the first time when I have ever spoken where I've been treated so dishonorably and the pressure comes from the Jewish war veterans, all these Jewish groups who never complain about the communists. I had to come up here at my expense, no fee, and I had to pay to come here to talk at Brown University because, first of all, my invitations were canceled by the college, and then when a brave bunch of kids invited me again, they were subjected to every kind of pressure in the world. A good example is right near where you're sitting. I told them every time I speak at a college, I draw the biggest crowds of any speaker they've ever had except possibly the president or somebody like that. Get a big hall. So what do they give them? Alumni hall. And they only let you have a few. And then they charge them $700 for police protection. And then you tell me that there is not some pressure? To, why, why hasn't this happened to the communists? If these Jews are not committing pressure in order to avoid to keep you from hearing this, how come this all happens right here, right now, tonight, in front of your eyes? What's going on? I maintain that there's nobody has the right to tell you what you can hear and what you can't hear. Now I want to show you why you are not allowed to know these facts and how the Jews go about it. They don't burn books. They're much more clever than to burn them. They have a much better technique, and we have a letter here that they sent out which will show you what their technique is, which is a lot viler than burning books. This is from the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. The publishers all over America, again, send to this document. 
Anybody who wants to challenge me, just send for it. I'll give you a printed copy of our original photo set. You send for it and you read it for yourself. I'm going to read you some excerpts and show you how these Jews operate so you can't find out what's going on. Listen to this. Scribners and Sons have just published a book by Madison Grant entitled The Conquest of a Continent. It is extremely antagonistic to Jewish interests, emphasized throughout as the Nordic superiority theory and the utter negation of any melting pot philosophy with regard to America. The book, by the way, at no time criticizes Jews. It simply says the white man is a master race and created America. The Jews don't want you to read about that or hear that. Now listen to what they do about it. Now think this is all. I'm going to read about six words in the next sentence, or seven words. You think what these words mean and what they've done. Here's the beginning of the third paragraph. We are interested in stifling the sale of this book. And they have. You can't get it. You can't buy it. They don't burn it, because then you know about it. They just quietly use their business genius, and I'm not about to deny that they're business geniuses. They can rise to the top of almost any business. They get control, and they simply say to booksellers, if you sell any book that we don't like, you won't get any more books. So you can't buy books that they don't like. And I maintain that's wrong. I told you, I've written a book. Maybe it's the worst book in the world, but don't you think you should be able to decide that for yourself? Do you think the Jewish war veterans and the Anti-Defamation League should be able to get together and say, you will not read Rockwell's book. You won't hear him speak. If he does speak, he'll speak in a small hall. We'll cut off his money. We'll do everything to shut him up. But I don't think you're so stupid that you can't judge and you have to have a bunch of Jewish war veterans tell you what you're going to like and what you're not going to like. This is what the whole thrust of my speech is, is that you are being not only denied information, but you are being told what you will like and what you will not like. And in case you rebel... In case you say, oh, no, I won't go along with that, they use plain, old-fashioned terrorism. Anybody thinks that they don't, try doing like I do. I mean, do it yourself. Get up and give a so-called anti-Semitic speech. Start talking about Churchill's paper out here on campus. And if, you, if you're not, unless you're very well organized and you've got troops, you'll find yourself with a bloody nose. I'm not telling you the truth. I'm, you just simply have got to fight. These Jewish war veterans will attack you. They have attacked me physically. I'm not afraid of them. I'd be glad to walk out any place where they are, but they, come, they don't argue with you. They won't deny what you say. They just say, we're going to shut you up. Now, I don't think that's American. These people claim they're American. They don't want to shut up communists. They want to shut up anti-communists. And if that doesn't tell what they're doing, then I don't know what I have to show for proof. I'd like to show one more document here. This one's a hard, hard one to get. This is about me, put out by the American Jewish Committee in Secrets. It's not for publication. And they send it all around to the editors and publishers of America. Again, if you don't believe me, you're welcome to get a copy of this charming Jewish document. It's called Bigot Seeking Buildup, The News Techniques of George Lincoln Rockwell. And it's eight long pages, my fellow Brown and Pembroke students here, eight long pages on how to be sure that you never hear a word that I have to say. It says, never argue with Rockwell, never refute his facts, just point out what a rat he is. That's the substance of this whole book. Just keep calling him a rat, a louse, sick, anything you can, call him names, argumentum ad hominem. Never argue his facts, because they can't. They have no facts to argue. They just simply abuse me and attack me physically, which is not argument. They have no facts to go on. Everywhere, all... You know how all you want everywhere? People are getting fed up with what's called minority pressure. People are fed up with it. This is supposed to be a majority government, not a government by a bunch of minorities who say, if you don't go the way we do, we're going to urinate the streets. We're going to have demonstrations over here. This government is supposed to go the way the majority wants it to go. But it ain't. This government goes the way the minority, that's the loudest and the brassiest, says it must go, and you know who that loud and brassy minority is. They get their way, and they've got to the point where how many of you people have the nerve anymore to come out? You'll say an Italian, or a Frenchman, or an Irishman. How many have the nerve to just say the word Jew? When I was in, in college right here, we used to say a nice Jewish boy. You never just say a Jew. You're scared. You don't maybe realize it down deeply, but they've got us scared to death. And that's one of the reasons... Well, any of you who think that you haven't, just try criticizing it. Just say, just try when you leave here, just as an experiment, whether you believe it or not, pick out the nearest Jew and say, you know, I think Rockwell is right. 
I think, I think you've got, got something there. You see what happens to you. If you're a professor here, get in your, up in your classroom tomorrow and say, I think Rockwell is right, and see how long you're teaching at Brown University. Which ought to show you something. This is supposed to be a free college. There's a lot of colleges in the country where people say, I'm a communist. Let's send blood to the Viet Cong. And if they try to fire them, the students uh, go out and kidnap the dean and tear up the school and so forth. Why couldn't a professor here be a Nazi? Well, you just try it. This has resulted, ladies and gentlemen, this, this climate of terrorism against an idea. Any idea against the fact that there is not equality among the races or any, uh, any information about the Jews is banned. If you mention anything about the races not being equal or that the Jews might be mixed up in communism or behind race mixing, if you talk about any of those things, you are silenced and shut up. And I don't think that's right. Maybe I'm wrong. I fully recognize that I could be wrong. But the way to show me that I'm wrong and get me to quit isn't to beat me over the head. Nobody will ever get me to quit by beating on me. And nobody will ever get me to quit by hollering rat like this man did. No matter what you call me, as long as I think I'm right in my heart, I'm going to preach it. But not one of these people that yell, not one of them, has ever got the guts to stand up in public and debate me and say, no, your facts are wrong, Mr. Rockwell. Here is the truth. Never. In six years of speaking at colleges, will one of these people do it? They say they will. I've had them come up on the stage and shake my hand. They're going to, they're going to debate next week, and when the next week comes, they're gone. They're on a vacation. You can't find them. These people have no argument to stand by. They have no facts. I do. And I'm going to believe them. As long as I have the documents, bag fulls, box fulls, library fulls of them, I'm going to believe the facts and not somebody screaming at me or trying to punch me in the nose. This has resulted, ladies and gentlemen, this de deprivation that you are suffering of, the lack of news, the lack of the facts, has resulted in what they call liberalism. I don't blame you a bit, given the fact that you're told that the only difference between Negroes and white people is that, one of the, that the Negro is a white man with a dark skin. If that's the truth, then we have no business discriminating one bit. We should marry them, we should mix with them, there should be absolutely no discrimination. If there is a difference other than the color of skin, then we ought to discuss it. But that you can't do. The minute you try to point out the fact that there are differences, psychological differences, other than color of the skin, then you're in trouble. You're a racist. You're a Nazi. You're a fascist. You're a hater. A bigot. All of these are names. Nobody discusses the facts. There's plenty of facts to prove exactly what the Negroes are. I'm not going to go into them tonight. I'll be glad to debate that subject, too, formally, at any time anybody wants to set one up. Nobody will. They simply use name-calling. The result is that this liberalism has spread throughout our country, and as I've said, I don't blame those who believe it because the facts give you no choice. If the facts are as they say they are, the Jews are wonderful, Negroes are even better, then we ought to mix. Jews ought to run the country, and we might as well fold up us white Christians. We, we've got no business trying to run our country. We're too stupid. But that isn't a fact. And what's happened, ladies and gentlemen, the Roman Empire perished from senility, from old age. It decayed. It went rotten. America is not an old country, but it is decaying. It's getting rotten. And right, right with me here in Providence, I have one of the communist Viet Cong flags that I tore down with my own hands and went to jail for doing it. The communist traitor that was parading around in front of our White House went on parading and I went to jail. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, when I was a student here at Brown University, right after that, when we got into World War II, if anybody had paraded around with a Jap flag or a Nazi flag, I'd have strangled them, and so would have every student at Brown, and the cops would have helped us. Today, people parade around with a flag of the enemy that's killing American boys. Might kill some of you kids sitting out here right now. And nobody will do anything. I try to get the VFW to go down and do something, the American Legion, the John Birch Society, anybody, go down and help us stop this treason. And they won't do it. Instead, the American Legion passes a uh, resolution saying that I'm mixed up with the communists and the Jewish war veterans try to get me shut up. Treason is going on right in our country, right in front of us, and nobody even gets indignant. Nobody cares anymore. But that's the least of it. This prevailing... Remember what Khrushchev said? They asked him how come he thought that he was going to take over the United States by 1972. He says, you're all too liberal to fight. Americans have become too liberal to fight. It's true. Americans just sit around and watch anything happen. Absolutely anything goes. And nobody will do anything about it. And this is why I so much admire the Open Mind Committee. They just told me here that they got a little bit put out when they saw all these communists speaking and I couldn't speak. 
They didn't agree with me, but they thought they'd form a committee to give me my right to speak, and that's the kind of thing that I did. That's why I'm an Nazi, because I got sick and tired of seeing people push and nobody doing anything about it. Everybody whispering, well, you know what the Jews did now? I was a conservative for years, and everybody would whisper about the Eskimos, and you know what those people did and so forth. Well, I think that's hypocrisy and cowardice. If you're a conservative and you know what the Jews are doing, you ought to tell people and discuss it in the open and not sneak around behind anybody's back about it. So I did something about it, and I'm trying to form a movement to create the vigor and the strength to stop the decay and the rot that is happening in America. Now, the reason that America is decaying and is getting rotten isn't because we're old, it isn't because we're senile and feeble, it is because we are being purposefully rotten. The soul of America is being rotted out by germs. It is being, at, at every point that you want to look, you will find it being consciously and purposefully turned rotten. Let me take a few examples. Let's take art and culture. I majored in philosophy, and I won first prize in the United States in 1948 for commercial art for a full-page ad in the New York Times for the American Cancer Society, so I know something what I'm talking about in art. And when I was studying art, they tried to make me draw this crazy stuff, screwball paintings and so forth, and I just couldn't see it. It looked crazy to me. And it looked crazy to the other people, but they wouldn't admit it. I just said, it is screwy. So I wouldn't do it. I did good art and, and won first prize. But I began to wonder, years later, when I got into this movement, where did this come from? Where did this screwy art begin? Who is the patron saint of this screwy stuff? It looks, looks like an automobile accident. It looks like an automobile accident in paint. Well, the guy that did it, the patron saint, is Picasso. And at first I thought he was a Spaniard. Well, I found out he was a communist. Of course, that's not too new to anybody. He did the, he did the peace stuff for Moscow, and he's a red, so I thought it was communist art. Then I found out the real secret. He's one of the boys. <laughs> And the next thing I began to examine was this screwy poetry. About seven years ago, two guys in Australia took the Australian Army Manual for the Control of Mosquitoes. And they took every seventh or eighth word and they put them on the page, sprinkled it all around like blank verse, and they won first prize in the International Poetry Contest. So I began to examine who is the patron saint, where did this come from? Well, it turns out it was a queer Jewish named Gertrude Stein. Remember, a rose is a rose is a rose, and her whole cult over there in Paris. Then they, at, at the Pratt Institute, where I studied art, they were going to teach me sculpture. So they took me down to study sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art, and you go into the Museum of Modern Art, and here is this big uh, podium, and they have it looks like somebody went out into a pasture and scooped up three or four and piled them up like this. And this... And this is sculpture. Well, who is the guy that's... Jacob Epstein is the patron saint of this thing. Well, I could go on and on. Any field you want to go, wherever you dig, you find the rot. Who is the guy that's going to the federal penitentiary for the rottenest, filthy magazine that's ever been printed? Ginsburg. Ralph Ginsburg. Who is the poet, the great beatnik poet that has the foulest, dirtiest poetry ever heard? Ralph Ginsburg. Not Ralph Ginsburg. What's his name? You know, the, 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 the bearded crud there, the bum. But to me, to me, ladies and gentlemen, it's bad enough that they're doing this to our culture. What they're doing is destroying all order in art. I know something about art, like I told you, and it's based on order and discipline. In fact, what they used to teach in colleges was called a discipline, the discipline of this and the discipline of that. Now, any discipline at all is considered some kind of treason. The students say, we want to run the college out at Berkeley. And if they don't, as I say, they kidnap the dean, kidnap the cops, push everybody around, and uh, the Negroes want to run the country. And if they don't, then they urinate all over the streets of Birmingham. And what they're doing, ladies and gentlemen, they are purposefully destroying order. You hear about law and order, the key thing is order. Without order, there is no society. And in order to have order, you've got to have law. Now, I just had a rally out in San Francisco about three weeks ago. I had a permit. I had every right to be there. And the police told me when I went to go down there that there were 3,000 longshoremen coming down to bust me up. So I said, well, I only got 26 guys Maybe you ought to have some policemen there. He says, no, he says, that'll provoke them. We won't have any police. 
So, as usual, I went down there anyway with my 26 guys, and sure enough, there were no policemen, and sure enough, the longshoremen and the beatniks and the cruds and the bearded bums and all kind of queers, everything they had in San Francisco descended on us. Every skid in a thousand miles was there, screaming and hollering, you're a bum, rock whether you're sick, listen, rock whether you're sick, and so forth, screaming, and they started throwing stuff and everything else. Finally, after, after a half an hour or so of this, two traffic cops showed up and tried to pinch me for parking. <laughs> so the cops almost got killed, trying to push, they said, now, fellas, please, please move back. You shouldn't do this. Now, you shouldn't be throwing those things at Rockwell. How about moving back in bay? And they shocked the cops. So the cops radioed for help. More cops came, a few more cops, and a few more. Still no helmets, still no clubs. By this time, the mob was a real riot. Everything going on all over. Then they had to bring in all the cops they could get. Riot helmets and sticks, beatings, teeth flying in every direction. What a fight that was. <laughs> now, do you know what happened during this beating going on? Five guys attacked the police. Five guys were arrested and put in the police patrol for attacking police officers. So the crowd attacked the police. They forgot me for a while. They attacked the police van. And do you know what the cops did? Guess what? They left them out because it might provoke them to take them off to jail. So they let the five guys out. Now, do you know what that means, ladies and gentlemen? Only one thing. It means that there is no law in San Francisco. If you've got a big enough mob, you tell the police what to do, not the other way around. Those cops should have used every gun they had in the whole army to keep those prisoners if they had to. If when, once you allow law to break down, there is no end. You have no law unless it's enforced. And in San Francisco, I, with my own eyes, saw a mob take over San Francisco and run the cops out to do what they had a mind to, and the cops just ran away. They couldn't do anything else. It's not the cops' fault, because politicians control police officers. And the first thing, well, I hear somebody having a big ball. He enjoys hearing about the cops having a tough time. The first thing that happens, ladies and gentlemen, when you destroy law and order is that you become defenseless. And this is what's happened in cities all over this country. Do you know that the girls in this auditorium could not, I don't know how it is in Providence here, when my day you were safe, but in Washington, D.C., right across from where I live, you could not walk along the streets of Washington, D.C. day or night. You'll be picked up by the cops and told that you better get somebody to be with you because you'll be raped. You can't walk on the streets because they're dropping out of trees, they're coming out of alleys. <laughs> Now, I'm not exaggerating, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you, this is a, they actually did drop out of a tree onto the daughter of one of the, one of the big State Department officials. Of course, some of the time when you drop on a State Department official, you might get surprised, you know, which sex you're dropping on. And while I'm on that subject, there's another example of what we've come to. This, this country has come to the point, when I, was, when I was a kid, you hardly ever heard of queers. Once in a while, you'd hear something about there was such a thing as queers, but I never, I don't remember seeing one or knowing much about them. Now they have a lobby to get rid of us, the Mattachine Society. They say we're dirty-minded. They have dances. They had a convention, and they got the biggest hotel, I think it was the Sheraton Park on the shore, and the biggest and best hotel in Washington they got for the queers convention. Now... It may sound funny, but my point is this, ladies and gentlemen. Our country has reached the point where we will tolerate anything. There is literally no limit to what will be tolerated. And the time has got to come where you draw the line at something, when you say, this is immoral and wrong and we're going to put a stop to it. Nobody will do it so long as law and order is gone. And this is what I maintain has happened in this country. Law and order is being consciously destroyed. You know this holler you hear, police brutality? Police brutality, I've had a little of it myself. But police brutality is a myth. There are some mean cops, but they're very rare. Most police officers that I've met are professionals. Most of them are pretty damn good. The police brutality business is to destroy your police department because that's the last thing between you and the takeover by the communists in the streets. That's what they've done all over the world. In order to do it, ladies and gentlemen, they have a little technique they call helping the oppressed. Now, in China... They went over there in China, and Mao Zedong was going to help the peasants. You people are probably too young to remember. The professors and some of the older people will remember, though. I remember what they told me right after World War II, 
after I got done fighting to preserve freedom, they told me that Mao Zedong wasn't a communist. He was an agrarian reformer, and he was trying to help the poor oppressed peasants of China, because they had it tough. And when people like me said, well, he looks to me like he's a communist, oh, no, 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 he, he's just an agrarian reformer. And then, of course, he took over, and he killed millions of people, put their heads in, cut their heads off and hung them up in telephone poles dripping. They all talk about Nazi atrocities. I wonder how many pictures they've shown you of communist atrocities. Did anybody take any trouble? Any Jewish war veterans ever show you what they did to in Russia to Christians? 20 million of them. Khrushchev said they killed 20 million Christians. You hear about the 6 million all the time. How about the 20 million of us that they got? No movies, no tears, no violent music. So Mao Zedong took over and killed everybody, and he is a communist, and all the State Department and all the great geniuses in Eleanor said, oh, we can't imagine how this could happen. Who would have thought that he was a communist? The next guy that comes along, we did everything we could to get rid of Batista in Cuba. He was a Christian and a friend of the United States, but he was a dictator. So we got rid of him. We gave him arms and did everything to help Mr. Castro. And Mr. Castro again. I was old enough and in the movement then, and I said, well, I think he's a communist. All the so-called right-wing nuts then were saying Castro was a communist. And Eleanor and Dean Rusk and Atchison and Truman, everybody said, why, he couldn't be a communist. He's helping the poor peasants. This is the truth. This is the second time around. And finally, they took him to the United States, and Ed Sullivan put his arm around Castro on television, said he's the George Washington of Cuba for the American people. And, of course, us nuts were still saying he's a red. He's a communist. And they go, ah, Red Bader, you're screaming, you're nuts, Rockwell, well, you're sick. So he turned out, and was he? He was a communist. The same technique, now notice the technique, they take a group of oppressed people, they are genuinely oppressed, the peasants of Cuba and the peasants of China. Then they, in the name of these oppressed people, they take over the government, and then they set up a dictatorship, a tyranny. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you have it going on right here, right under your noses, right here in America, and many of you are helping without knowing what you're doing. The oppressed here are black. I won't argue with that. They got a tough life, and they need help. But the commies have moved in and said, now nah, we're going to help you good people, and we're going to have marches, and lions, and crawlings, and squirmings, and weddings, and everything we can, and they, all, this, all these things going on, and they get you people to go down to Selma and help them. And the guy that's meeting in is Martin Luther King Jr. And I keep saying, yeah, but look at all the red organizations he's joined. He's got a, red, a communist assistance. He's red. Why? How can you say that? He's for the colored people. He's for the oppressed. He couldn't be a communist. Same people that told you Mao Zedong wasn't a communist, couldn't be. Same people told you Castro couldn't be a communist. Now they say, Rock, when you're sick, Martin Luther King couldn't be a communist. And yet I can show you the manuals where they show how they're going to overcome police departments, exactly how they're going to do it. And they're doing it step by step. They're doing here just what they did in China, just what they did in Cuba and you're helping them. And the first thing you've got to do to do it is to destroy law and order, destroy your police departments. We have the manuals where they show how they will actually overcome the riot control police officers. They holler police brutality. Every time a police officer arrests a black man, he is in danger of losing his job, maybe his life, maybe being electrocuted because he killed a last time in San Francisco, the last riot when I was out there, was one of these colored brothers was robbing a place and he was running off with the loot, and the police officer told him to stop, and he wouldn't. He shot over his head twice, and he still wouldn't stop, so he shot him. So they had the San Francisco riots over this. And the police officer lost his job. He got it back, but he lost it for a while, and he almost lost it permanently. He had to fight like the devil to keep it. Now, this, ladies and gentlemen, is going to destroy your country. You say, how come could you go from a brown man who did pretty little cartoons from Sir, for Sir Brown to a Nazi? Well, because I found out that the communists are doing to my country just what they did to Germany in the 20s. Exactly the same. The same inflation, the same insanity, the same destruction of law and order, the same inflation is almost here, the same riots, the same bedlam, and the same Jews operating it. Even the same Jews. Same people that were over there are here now. The gas, six million, most of them are over here running the civil rights movement. Same people. I found this out to be a fact. There's no argument about it. It is a fact. And when you look at it as a fact, what are you going to do about it? Just let it go? Well, I, the only thing I could see to do it, first I became a conservative. And I promptly became thoroughly and totally disenchanted and disgusted with conservatives. They are the most cowardly bunch of things that I have ever had to deal with. 
They're all busy calling me a communist now, so as to prove that they're not Nazis. This is what the Birch Society says, this is what Hagen says, all these uh, 19, 19 sweet pants are all busy saying, oh, Rockwell, he's a commie, don't, don't go near him. They're, they're absolutely disgusting. So I gave up being a conservative and I said, I'm going to fight. I'm going to tell the truth, the whole truth, every bit of it I know. And I have been. And ever since then, it's, in spite of the toughness of the fight, I have been winning some of the most wonderful people I've ever met. People who are no cowards, people who are no hypocrites. Our country is drowning in hypocrisy and cowardice. Now, will you tell me how a cowardly, hypocritical conservative who says, I love Jews and Negroes are my best friends, how is he going to save his country from hypocrisy doing that? So I became a Nazi because I found out what a Nazi is. A Nazi is a man who believes in the white race above all things. Adolf Hitler said the white race is a master race. That doesn't mean we have to persecute anybody else, but it means we've got to keep our own country white. If Israel is a Jewish country and has the right to be Jewish, if Ghana is a black country and has the right to be black, why don't we have the right to keep a white country white? And Christian, well, how long do you people think you'd last if you went over there to Israel and campaigned in the Jewish schools in Israel against singing Jewish songs? And yet they're over here campaigning against us singing Christmas carols in ours. And in school after school, state after school, they get them stopped. You can't sing Christmas carols in school anymore. They won't tolerate it, but we must. I'm just simply saying Hitler discovered that this has gone far enough and he stopped it in Germany. There's only three places on the face of the earth that have ever whipped communism, not talked about it like Rabbit Welch or Billy James Hoggins, but have actually whipped it. And those three places are Spain, and they hate Spain, Italy, and Germany. They whipped communism and got rid of it. And to do it, of course, they had a little difficulty with the Jews. Because the minute you go after communists, you're going to run into the Jews, which is why the Burke Society can never get any place, because they keep saying how they love Jews and they hate communism. It's like saying you love to go swimming, but you hate to get wet. You can't do it. The result of all of this, ladies and gentlemen, they are destroying law and order. They're destroying our culture, destroying our civilization. And they have got millions of good, sincere Americans, like many of you out here, helping them to do it. Because you really believe you're helping to build a better world. This is the way they work all over the world. They tell you you're helping build a better world, and they play the violin. They tell you about these poor Jews in, in Germany and all the terrible things that happened. They don't tell you what the Jews did to Germany and what they're doing to our country here. And anybody who tries to tell you, then they use terrorism to shut him up. Any way at all. Cut down his audience, raise hell, do anything you can, but don't let him get to the people. Because I know in my heart, I'm telling the truth as well as I know how to do it. And I can reach yours. I do it at every school I go to. I'll get letters from Brown University starting tomorrow telling me I didn't dare say anything, but I'm with you. Every time I speak, this happens, but you're all scared to come up as a body and say, I think you're right because of this terrorism. And this, ladies and gentlemen, has got to stop. No man in America should be afraid to say what's in his heart. And we are. That's why I'm a Nazi, because I am not any longer going to be a slave to fear, be afraid to say what I believe is the truth. As I've said, if I'm wrong, show me and I'll quit. But quit calling me sick and calling me names and trying to punch me in the face. It will never stop me. It has never stopped our forefathers. No American in the history of this country has ever backed down because somebody beat on him or called him sick or threw stuff at him. No, no American worthy of the name, and I'm not about to. I'm going to wind this up, ladies and gentlemen, by saying this. The conservatives have a slogan which I think is despicable and defeatist. They say it's better to be dead than red. And the commies and the liberals have a slogan which I think is even worse. It's treason. They say it's better to be red than dead. We say this, you don't have to be red and you don't have to be dead. Not dead, not red, dead reds. I thank you all very much. You've been most courteous and I certainly enjoyed deeply talking to you and I'll be glad to answer questions. Turn around what? Just turn around when you're done with one and I'll come up with All right. One, okay? Just give me one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have the first question. Mr. Rockwell, will you please give us a brief definition of communism, parenthesis, not Judaism, and parenthesis, question mark. In my opinion, communism is the organized mutiny 
I'm going to say this slow because it's a lot packed into a few words. In my opinion, communism is the mutiny of quantity versus quality. I think the, the communism is the organized mutiny of the inferior biological people in the world led by the Jews against the people who have built civilization. That's what I think it is. Yes. If the Russian Revolution was a Jewish takeover, why were so many Jews there persecuted? Why did so many emigrate? Do you know the name of the deputy... Uh, the deputy premier of the Soviet Union right now, his name is Dimchitz, and he's a Jew. The name of the head of propaganda is Ilya Ehrenberg, and he's a Jew. The, the Soviet Union army, the Red Army, is full of Jews. The, uh, the Jewish examiner for two weeks ago had a big article about how some Russian general was, the, uh, was a Jew and was the top, most honored general in the Russian army. Do you know what they're persecuting in Russia? Not Jews. They are persecuting religion. Anybody who believes in religion, they're going after them. If you're a Protestant, you're getting it. If you're a Catholic, you're getting it. Whatever, you're Buddhist. Any religion is getting it. The Jews just holler louder than anybody else, so we hear about it more. Now, you may say to me, yes, but you can't be a Jew unless you're religious. I have to have me with me a book here to show you how foolish that argument is. A lot of Jews will tell you it's impossible for communism to be Jewish because a Jew believes in God, and a communist is an atheist. Well, true. Well, then I would like the Jews to explain something. Here is a book just out, cost $35, Who's Who in World Jewelry. At the front of it, it says, this is an honor roll of the world's great Jews, finest Jews in the world. Listen to the, listen to the list of people that put it out. The American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, American Jewish Historical Society, Anti-Defamation League, B'nai B'rith, B'nai B'rith, B'nai B'rith Hillel Foundation, Canadian Jewish Congress, and there's about 25 or 30 of them here, a lot more of them. Every... Uh, great Jewish organization in the world is listed here as a sponsor of this book. Now I want to show you what they list in the honor roll as one of the great Jews that they're so proud of. Page 29. Here we are. On page 29 of Who's Who in World Jewry, which is supposed to be a religious group, here's Herbert Aspecker, the chief theoretician of the Communist Party on the Roll of Honor of World Jews. Now, doesn't this show you something, whether the Jews consider themselves a religion, or are they a race? And the answer is, ladies and gentlemen, they are a group of people that you can recognize, some of them anyway, by their face. Not all, but most Jews, I, if I had a blackboard here as an artist, I could draw you a picture with a big long nose and you'd all giggle because it looked like a Jew. I can't draw a picture of a Protestant, I can't draw a picture of a Catholic, I couldn't even draw a picture of a Baptist, except maybe Martin Luther King. But you wouldn't, uh, in fact, there's one Jew I could think of, I could draw you'd make a mistake, Sammy Davis Jr., you'd never think I was drawing a Jew. But the, the point is, my point, ladies and gentlemen, is the Jews keep putting out that they are just a religion, and yet they themselves list the top communist in America as a Jew. And he doesn't object, it's very proudly in the book. So what's going on in Russia, ladies and gentlemen? They are persecuting all people who have a religious belief, and the Russian atheist Jews are doing this to them. It's one bunch of Jews after the other bunch. And this is not anti-Semitism. So much for that question. Mr. Rockwell, if a Negro, Jew, Italian, or Irishman came up to you or spoke before you saying that all white Anglo-Saxon Protestants are filthy subversives, wouldn't you want to hit them? Yes. Could you please discuss and enumerate any positive feelings you have toward the Negro and Jew? That is, any characteristics they have which you don't object to. I have no objection to the fact that the Negroes, in my opinion, and this, of course, is the thing that everybody gets so excited, you're not supposed to say this, but I think they're biologically inferior. Not all of them. You may have some here who are smarter than I am. I'm talking about the average ghetto Negro, the great mass of Negroes just can't make it in modern urban society. That's not their fault, it's not mine. But the way to remedy it is not to take your rights away and give it to the Negroes, because it won't help either one of you. It pulls everybody down. I, however, will say this. The Negroes have a tremendous sense of rhythm. They're great singers. They're great dancers. They've got a lot of positive things you can say for them. This is what the guy asked me. What positive things can you say? I think the Negroes in their own country 
would be, could be very happy. And the Muslims for a while wanted to do that. And I've gone this far. If we have to do it to solve the problem, I want to separate. I don't believe segregation will work, and I don't think in, I know integration won't work. The only solution I see is separation. And if we can't get them to Africa, I'm willing to give them part of the United States, namely Miami Beach and Brooklyn. <laughs> Now, as to the Jews, my favorite subject. As to the Jews, my dear friends, they ask me what positive things can you say about them, I will say this. I will not deny for 10 minutes that I think Jews are superior on the average, I'm not saying all Jews are, but the average Jew is superior to the average Gentile in business. I think they're damn good businessmen. And there's no getting around it. They succeed time and again where our people fail. They're good businessmen. What I object to is the way they use it, and let me give you an example. Through the Jewish business genius, they have managed to rise to the top of an industry which now controls the minds of America. The most powerful medium in the world is television. You have only three television networks, just three. NBC, CBS, and ABC. NBC, the chairman is Robert Sarnoff, a Russian Jew. ABC, the chairman is Leonard Goldenson, a Russian Jew. CBS, the chairman is William Paley. He's listed in here as William Palinsky, another Russian Jew. You've got three Jews that control everything you see on the television. And as a result, even though 85% of the serious crime in this country is committed by Negroes, have you ever seen a Negro criminal on the TV? I never have. Every time you see a Negro, he's a judge or a lawyer or a very great man. And on the contrary, on the opposite hand, whenever I see a whodunit, one of these things like Perry Mason, and you're trying to figure out who's the dirty rat that did it. I wait till I hear a guy come along and says, ah, hi, y'all, I'm from Alabama. He done it. That's the guy. <laughs> He's usually unshaven and dirty and filthy. Southern white Christian Protestant, no good. That's what's happened to your television because what I'm getting at, the Jewish businessmen have used their genius to get to the top, which is their privilege because I believe in free competition. But then they have used or misused it, abused their power to brainwash our country so that you don't anymore know what's going on. They have had every national figure on the television, even Leroy Jones I saw him on, the man who uh, produced the toilet with a bunch of Negro boys urinating on a white boy's face in a urinal. They had him on television the other night with uh, Norman Mailer, who is the, uh, a, a, like they used to have in Rome, they had guys who divined the future by looking at birds and trails. Norman Ray Mailer is a bowel movement investigator. <laughs> And he says that if he can examine a man's stools for color and size and odor and movement, he can tell you the color and the nature of the man. This is what they had on television, but not once have they ever let any of the tapes they've made of me get on this national television, so you could judge me for yourself. These Jews don't want people to listen to Rockwell. They want you to read Playboy magazine and read what some guy says I said. They don't want you to hear George Lincoln Rockwell or see him. So my answer is to those two things, the Negroes are good singers and runners and uh, fighters and a lot of other things like that. The Jews are good businessmen. If the Jews are the leaders of the communist movement, why do the communists support the Arabs against Israel? The man says, if, if I'm going to either run this order here, I'm not going to speak. If the Jews... <laughs> Would you like me to quit? I'll be glad to quit. All right. Well, let's tell these Jews to shut up and I'll go ahead. Thank you. I am not going to speak in the middle of disorder. When the Jews are quiet, I'm going to continue. Now's your chance, Jews. Go ahead and let the Christians... If the Jews are leaders of the communist movement, why do the communists support the Arabs against Israel? Well, first of all, not all the communists do support the Arabs against Israel. The largest communist party in the whole Middle East is in Israel. 25% of Israel is communist. So this question answers itself on its face. The communists do not support uh, Israel, I mean the Arabs, against Israel, except Red China. And I might say this. I believe communism is rapidly disappearing from the world as an issue. I think the issue is rapidly going to become race. 
The red Chinese are not half as much communists as they are colored nationalists. Our colored people are saying, we don't want to go over and kill colored Vietnamese. Red China and red Chinese strategy is to go to Africa and Asia and put all the colored people together, and the Russians have said so. The ambassador to France, when France recognized Peking, the Russian ambassador to France said, Does, do not the French realize that Mao Zedong wants to put Africa, Asia, and China together against all whites, including Russia? So that I think what's happening, when you find that you say communism is supporting the Arabs, it's red China is supporting the Arabs, because the Arabs and that whole colored community there consider themselves colored much more than Arabs. When they talk about imperialists, they mean white imperialists. When they talk about colonialists, they mean white people. Do you realize how many Negroes the Russians have been thrown into snow banks and deep freezing up there in Moscow? You don't hear too much about it, but the last Negroes from Africa and the last red Chinese are being kicked out of Russia. They're colored. They're having the same problems that we are. So when you say communism is supporting the Arabs, it is not communism, it's the red Chinese. Next question. This will be the last question I'm told. How is your presidential campaign for 1972 coming along? Uh, Getting a lot of senators and congressmen elected with the open title of Nazi, as you promised in your interview of 1960 with a New York radio station. I would say this to you, you have only to look around the world and see what's happening. My kind of people are getting elected. Whether they have my title or not doesn't make too much difference at this point. Lester Maddox either has made it or came close to it, and he's a friend of mine, I know him, and he's a great man. All over this country, people are beginning to get fed up with forced race mixing. People are getting fed up with just what I said they would. Now you say, how's my campaign coming? My campaign depends on two things that I predicted back in 1960. Race riots. In 1960, there hadn't been any, and I said they would be all over this country. They are. Now I tell you, the next thing I need, and the only thing I need now to win, is inflation. They have already taken the gold from your paper money. Then they took the silver from your paper money. Now they've taken the silver from your silver. And you've got phony money. This is just what they did in Germany, ladies and gentlemen, and catastrophic inflation is not far ahead. And as I told you, when you finally get a good dose of it, when you get all you're going to take of Negroes pushing you, and when you get all you're going to take of rotten, phony money that's worthless, then you're going to be looking for somebody to put a stop to it. You're not going to be looking for talk, you're going to be looking for somebody to fight. And this is what I'm going to do for my country. I did it in World War II in Korea, and I'm going to do it again. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you.